a really great pleasure to welcome Simon Penny. Um, I guess I really don't need to give a very long introduction because many of you would know of him and his work. So for many, many years, Simon has been at the forefront of um, media and arts practice, particularly with robotics, but also in theory. Um, um, so he's, he's an artist, he's a theorist, he's um, an academic, um, uh, and he's just a very nice person too. Uh, <laughs> so um, Simon's um, very generously taken out time from his very busy schedule. Um, he gave a talk at Clayton yesterday that Alan organised in the morning, which was a little bit more theoretical, but turned out to talk about the work that we're doing today, I think. But today he's going to talk about his pioneering artworks that he's been developing over the last school, maybe 30 years. Pretty much close to 30 years. Um, and I think it would be really interesting to reflect on how pioneering these works are you know, at the time that they were made compared to some of the stuff that we see happening now. So hopefully there'll be some time for discussion um, as part of this event with Simon too. So I won't take up any more time except to say welcome, Simon. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, now, is this session nominally three or four? Yeah. All right. So generally, I mean, it's up to you how long you want to speak for, but we like to leave a lot of time for discussion. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Fine. So I suppose the first thing I should do for this group is to is to just kind of give a quick kind of biographical outline on Australia. Uh, I trained as a sculptor at the South Australian School of Art. Um, through the 80s, I, I worked as an independent artist in Australia. Um, and I have to say, uh, it was a fairly frustrating time and it was very difficult to find opportunities to do the sorts of work I wanted to do. Um, There's very limited support, very limited uh, discourse in the area. And as a result, I spent most of the 80s, or much of the 80s, coming out of a sculpture performance and installation background, developing both the technical skills and kind of theoretical perspectives for building uh, interactive installations. So I was interested in building um, things that were coming out of a sculptural and installation kind of context, um, but, but that were articulated electronically. Uh, so I, I ended up, this was long before I had any access to a, a desktop PC. In any case, at the time, they were useless for what I wanted to do because of the absolute paucity of input output capabilities right so um, I ended up teaching myself process control electronics and building up um, sort of sensor effector systems fairly of a fairly rudimentary uh, kind but which worked in the spaces with people moving around sculptural entities which were mechanized and and uh, you know came into action based on on sometimes I actually built um, some simple sense of fusion electronics where I would where I would combine uh, data from different sensors along with various sort of timing factors all of which was built at the integrated VLSI integrated circuit chip and discrete component level um, which which turned out to be incredibly useful because I was really able to formulate my idea of the articulation of the relationship between sensors and, and effectors at a very fundamental level, at the level of resistors and capacitors and diodes and transistors. Um, and at the same time, of course, I had to kind of justify what it was I was trying to do in terms of cultural practices. And so for that same period of time I was developing a language of the aesthetics of interactivity um, although I didn't call it that at the time because the word wasn't used right so fortuitously uh, I, I'd been traveling a little bit uh, into Europe and the United States and giving the odd talk when I had an opportunity and fortuitously I was offered a, a one-year visiting artist position at Carnegie Mellon University uh, in Pittsburgh in the in 1989 um, Some of you may know that Carnegie Mellon is one of the three leading artificial intelligence and robotics uh, campuses in the United States, the others being MIT and Stanford. 
And hence both uh, uh, Alan Newell and Herbert Simon, founders of artificial intelligence effectively, were on the faculty there. So um, I actually you know, had lunch with Alan Newell. And Opportunity to, to, and I was, by great good fortune, I ended up getting a tenure, a tenure track position there, with, with the fantastic title of professor of art and robotics, and I used to tell people I'm the worst professor of art and robotics in the world, <laughs> uh, and it was true. Um, yeah, but yeah, exactly. <laughs> but. Two things, you know, that experience, two things occurred. First of all, I found that coming into that context where there was a rapidly expanding interest in utilization of computing in the arts, my sort of 10 year isolation in Australia, developing my work and my ideas about the work, gave me a huge advantage. And I was essentially 10 years ahead of the game discursively. And, and that served me very well. I think my last five years. But in any case, I, I realized that, that what people were just starting to try and grapple with, I'd been doing for five to 10 years. And I sort of developed a bit of a handle on it entirely independently. But the other thing about it was that most of the people who were coming into that stuff because of the way that desktop multimedia and other sorts of things, as they were called then, formulated the nature of practice. It was primarily screen-based, so that people who were coming into it thought of it in terms of video, in terms of film, in terms of image media and photography. And then secondarily, they thought about it in terms of sound. And, and the world, the kind of the sensory world was thereby channeled into these sort of paradigmatic channels of there is there's a thing called image which happens on a rectangular screen or, or, you know in front of you and it's this big or sometimes on a wall like that and there's this thing called sound which comes out of two speakers right and and, and the kind of narrowness of this paradigm was in in huge conflict with the rhetoric of the sort of liberatory, liberatory potential of, of the technology itself. And so that's one of the things that has um, you know, been a real focus for me in my work is that one, seeing the way that designed technologies constrain creativity. Right? So every single hardware widget or piece of software that you buy has been designed by a person or people who imagine they know what it is you want to achieve, and most of my time was spent actually pulling the shit apart because it didn't do what I needed to do, or ultimately throwing it away, right, and making my own, which I did many times. Because, and I'll give you an example when I show this piece of work I did in the cave, virtual reality immersive space work in a moment where I, I started working with what was the kind of most authoritative kind of virtual reality authoring environment. And I found that I had to throw it away because the paradigm of virtual reality, as it was in the mid 90s, was a paradigm of navigation through virtual architectures. And it probably hasn't changed much, right? Well, I wanted to work with immersive interaction but I wasn't interested in navigation or virtual architectures. So all of those parts of the, of, of the toolkits were just absolutely worthless to me. Interestingly, the hardware itself, the silicon graphics, you know, refrigerator sized, liquid nitrogen cooled, super fantastic, uh, multi-channel synchronized VR engines and all the rest of it, were also optimized at a hardware level for these kinds of paradigms. And so when I made my piece Traces, we were forced to use raw hard hardware graphics routines because they were the only things that we could actually pump through the system fast enough 
to give us real-time interaction. So when you see this thing, you'll see that the graphics are kind of incredibly rudimentary. They were far more rudimentary than you would imagine these computational technologies could produce and were producing for other people because I wasn't throwing texture maps on, 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 on wireframe objects. I just wasn't doing it. It wasn't so. But the other thing that happened at Carnegie Mellon was that I started partly because I was um, able to connect with robotics and AI research at a very sophisticated level and you know just hang out with grad students who were you know working in that context, etc. etc. I started to feel that my original sort of unease with the way the technology was being framed and set up was not just a, my lack of understanding or s particular limitations in particular kinds of widgets, but was a fundamental and deep problem in principle. And out of that arose a kind of philosophical critique of Compute, computational culture and artificial intelligence, which still propels me. Um, and the project I've been working on for the last three years now, and I'm just bringing it to completion, is Book Manuscript, which really looks at the relationship between the worldview of the arts and the worldview of computing culture. And I want to refer to some of that stuff a little bit later in the talk, but to just kind of introduce that idea, the fundamental idea that I sort of started to it started to become clear to me because I was trying to build technologies for embodied interaction, and I thought I, I found the technology was fighting me every step of the way, and what I ended up increasingly being convinced of is the problem was with the philosophical grounding of the ideology of computer science in a fundamentally dualistic concept. So the fact that within computer science hardware and software are two completely separate sorts of phenomena, for me, spoke of nothing more than the implementation and the reification of Cartesian dualism. That is, the mind-body dualism. So there's nothing more clear, right, that than the fact that mind-body dualism and software-hardware dualism are essentially the same idea. One is abstract information, abstract reasoning capability which has no materiality. The other is materiality which has no intelligence. Now, as an artist, as someone whose intelligence is lived in practice, in engaging the contingencies of materiality and, 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 and hitting yourself on the back of the hand with a sledgehammer, right? It, as, as anyone who does that kind of practice, whether it be taekwondo or, or, or ballroom dancing or, or pottery, if any, you, you, you can't think about that kind of intelligent practice easily without jumping through sorts of mental hoops if you apply this kind of mind-body dualism, that the body is stupid and the mind is smart, but immaterial. It just doesn't work. Right? So I realized that that was the sort of critical and philosophical battle that I was fighting with the technology. And every piece that I made was a kind of critical um, interrogation and a critique of the value system of computer science while I was doing other stuff, right? Because what I wanted to do, I wanted to build technologies with which we could interact as humans 
in the enormously sophisticated embodied way that we as humans interact with each other, right? I've got my hand gestures going, I'm meeting your gaze, you're interpreting the tone of my speech, and, and all of that is part of the way that we're communicating with each other. So I looked at these stupid little plastic boxes with these stupid little keyboards and their stupid little on, and on the other hand I kind of looked at the sorts of you know wonderfully expressive practices that, that people engage in, in in really ordinary kinds of activities and I thought there's nothing advanced about this technology. This technology is completely disabled. You know, why should, if this technology is so damn smart, why should I have to pre-digest the world and encode it as alphanumeric keystrokes? There's something wrong here, right? And of course, what was wrong comes right back to the history of artificial intelligence. Right? When, when Al Newell and Herb Simon come up with their physical symbol system hypothesis, right, which is essentially a kind of footnote on functionalism, right? They, they said a physical symbol system is necessary and sufficient basis for intelligence. Right? That's the physical symbol system hypothesis. That means you don't need embodiment to be intelligent. Right? It reduces intelligence in a very Victorian way to the manipulation of alphanumeric symbols or symbolic representations, shall we say, in some sort of closed mathematical reasoning space. So while computer science and its offshoot cognitive science could would characterize intelligence in those terms, it's utterly unable to address embodiment. But while it addressed intelligence in those terms, it could concentrate on automated reasoning intelligence without having to think about how do we get meaning from the world you know how where the hell do those symbols come from because they're not just hanging on trees right so so the whole sort of artificial intelligence cognitivist paradigm diminishes the significance of our perceptual intelligence and says oh that's all just a to d don't worry about that that's just a kind of translation we you know the world flows in and it's just translated into symbol simple we'll get to that we haven't quite fixed that problem yet but one day when the video cameras are better that'll just fall out right that was the argument of 1980s artificial intelligence research and 1970s right that the kind of these you know and it's in the, the kind of language that they use already tells you what the belief structure is. These things were called peripherals. They're still called peripherals. You know? It's like, no, no. The fact that from this cacophony of the world, I can extract significance, that's already intelligence. And there's plenty of biological and ethological evidence that says that's happening right on the skin of my eyeballs. That's happening right in the flesh of the bat's ear. That's happening in the topography of the cellular structure of the fly's compound eye. You know, so so the the artificial intelligence paradigm in saying no intelligence happens right in, in the black box of the cranium. The rest of it is just meat, <coughs> right? Means it's. That premise, which made making the kind of work I wanted to make difficult. And by trying to make 
that kind of work, as I said, and seeing it as a kind of critical intervention into the discourse of AI and computer science, I've become increasingly persuaded that that worldview, that way of thinking about intelligence, is what has caused us to be unable to usefully talk about the intelligences of the arts. Right? So, where does that take us to is very interesting because in the, in the late 80s and early 90s, as people started to realize that this physical symbol system hypothesis was not sufficient for intelligent action, then there emerged this new range of different uh, approaches to cognition, right? Which you may have heard of some of them, situated cognition, distributed cognition, extended cognition, inactive cognition, embodied cognition. They're the main kind of genres of a, a way of thinking about cognition which in one way or another wanted to move beyond this idea of uh, of cognition as being something that happens locked inside the black box of the cranium, but is somehow connected with the world, right? It's connected the world through it with the world through embodiment, through iterative action, through sociality, through the utilization of artifacts, and through the utilization of intelligently constructed spaces. And so what the what the these various post-cognitivist theorists are saying is that Intelligence is not limited to and this is something I would argue. Intelligence suffuses the body and it's absurd to, you know, cut the head off at the neck and say that's the smart bit and the rest of the rest of it's stupid. Right? And increasingly we get neurophysiological and other physiological evidence that's supporting these kinds of ideas, right? That you know, you know, we're integrated dynamical systems and, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So the first, the first idea that comes out of that, those new ideas of cognitive science is that intelligence is an embodied phenomenon. The second idea that comes out is that, is that intelligence extends into the world, that, that the that the edge of the biological membrane may not be in many ways a useful a useful border to apply when we're talking about things like intelligence and intelligent action. And you know, I'm not sure how many of you know Ed Hutchins' book, uh, Cognition in the Wild, but, but he does a, 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 it's a wonderful case study of um, navigation on a, on, a, on a ship's bridge you, where a number of different people, different instruments, different resources, and different kinds of procedures all interact to produce intelligent action, which not one of the devices nor, nor one of the human participants can claim to be their own. Right? And you can extrapolate this idea. So, you know, what's the intelligence of a, intelligence of a, of a football team? You know, does a football team, you know, behave in a way that's more intelligent? Well, this is emergent complex behavior, right? And it takes us back into all of that sort of artificial life, emergent complexity theory. Um, it also takes us to actor network theory. And one of the interesting things that I've noticed is that the embodied cognitive science crowd and the actor, actor network crowd never really intersected because there were cognitive scientists over here and sociologists over there. And someone spoke English or something. Anyway, it's interesting. But I did recently find, actually, a, a review by Bruno Latour of, of Hutchins' book, which, which, um, which I was pleased about. And, and he, in fact, was saying, yes, actually, what Hutchins is doing here is looking at actor networks from a slightly different perspective, which, which is really kind of wonderful. So, to end, just to tail off my introduction here, for me, as an artist who has worked with computational technologies at both a very deep technical level and 
at a theoretical level, I see the new discourses of cognitive science, of what I call post-cognitivism, as offering the opportunity to help us build a language which, which can speak about the intelligences of practice, that can speak about the intelligences of art practices. And for me, that's a really important thing, and that's my current project, that's what the book's about, because for the last hundred years, psychology, philosophy of mind, cognitive science have essentially put art practice and cultural practice in the too hard basket, right? It's just like, you know, we can talk about playing chess, you know, because it looks like a kind of symbolic mathematical operation. kind of cultural practice is just too difficult. There's embodiment, there's sociality, there's all these things, right? And as a result, it's one of the reasons why art, art and artisanal practices have been relegated to a kind of second-rate status in the academy, right? And kind of in the intellectual world in general, right? Because we haven't had a language to put the intelligences of those kinds of practices, and I'm also talking about, you know, clinical practices in medicine and, and you know, any number of other sorts of embodied practices which have been kind of poo-pooed by the academy. Why? Well, this is an interesting sort of correlate with, with my critique of computer science. You know, that, that what academics do in general is that they look at the world and they produce symbols. You know, whether it's an equation or a program or a poem or a philosophical treatise, you know, they kind of mine the resources of the world and generate abstract representations. Right? And that, those abstract representations have all the wonderful qualities of abstract representations. They're general, and you know, it's, and they're abstract, right? Which is all great. But when you have cultural practices and art, real stuff is in the sensorial and experiential realm. And I, I remember actually, now I've come to think of it, I remember realizing back in the mid-90s when I was kind of moving in the HCI circles, I, I suddenly had this realization of why art and, and computer science demos were so different. Because, you know, I mean, you think, well, I guess these people, these computer scientists or these HCI people or whoever they are, and they're, they're producing an artifact. They're producing a, a proof of principle, and it's, it's tangible, and it's there, you know? But mostly they didn't work, and mostly they were kludges, and mostly... And, but what was interesting about them was, here's this material thing, but it exists as a pointer to an abst a more coherent abstract formula. Right? And it didn't matter that it was a piece of junk. Whereas for artists, the exact opposite was true. You know, what's important is creating this persuasive experiential sensorial experience that just goes, whoa, okay, I get it. You know, and who cares what's behind the curtain? You know, it could be a wind-up gramophone hooked up to a, you know, infrared sensor hooked up to a lawnmower. It doesn't matter. Right? Because what was important was the experiential dimension. So, having said that, I'm going to show you videos of a couple of works and then we can talk. Um, so, yeah, this is the kind of... Uh, um, wow, okay, it's very tiny, isn't it? This, this is... Uh, let's see, I should, should plug in the audio. Yeah, I don't know which one. 
cured of cats yet. Maybe this. Uh, not that it matters much for this video. So this is a um, autonomous robotic artwork I built in. Started building in 1989. It's called Petit Mal. Um, there's really not much audio on here that's worth listening to. That stayed in 1996 because those were the. Well, anyway, this is in Finland in '94 or something. So the whole idea of this is it just interacts with people in the way that they're used to interacting with other physically embodied things like other people and animals and things. It turns to face you, it approaches you, it backs off if you get too close. And when you go away, it does something else. Right? And of course, it, its movement is limited by amount of power it's got at its disposal and its ability to stop in front of the wall without crashing into it and all sorts of other compromises one has to make. Hmm. That, that's running on a 68 HC11 chip at 2.2 megahertz, at 2.1 megahertz uh, with 128k of RAM. And all of the sensor technology I built from the ground up, it's, uh, it, it's, it's um, pyroelectric and infrared. Sorry, pyroelectric and sonar. An incredibly small amount of data is getting processed by, by the processor because it's too stupid. And it's a sort of self-animating, so it makes it look at the zone, it's, it's sort of possibly more alive than it is. Nicely put. <coughs> right, right. And, and indeed, one of the things that I wanted to achieve with this was to, to, was to have a really sort of integrated combination of code and materiality. So actually, it's, it, it's actually a, 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 a complex, uh, a, what do you call it, a... a um, a compound pendulum structure, and as some of you might know, who know something about chaos theory and complexity theory, a compound pendulum is a fundamentally unpredictable mechanical phenomenon. is at its heart mechanically completely unpredictable. <laughs> and yet, you know, for all that, it, uh, it, it gives a, a persuasive sense of knowing what's going on in its world. And part of that, as you say, is communicated by its dynamics. Robots at Carnegie Mellon looked like giant hockey pucks at the time. You know, they were, they were, going, uh, uh, they were like trash cans. So I was like, that's <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Petit mal, as you may know, is, is a form of epilepsy, which um, is characterized by kind of breaks in, in short-term memory. And petit mal has no memory at all. 
Betty Mile in, in, interprets every moment in the present and has, uh, uh, I shouldn't say no memory, it's all it's no effective past or, or future, no plan at all. And yet, you know, in those days, in order to make an effective robot, it, it was it, part of the doctrine of artificial intelligence robotics was the sense map plan act paradigm, which was you sense the world, you built an internal representation of the world, you constructed a map <coughs> on that internal representation, you then instructed the end effectors to go that place in the world that you've indicated on the map, and then you remeasure everything and and uh, find out if you if the world corresponds with your map. Betty Mild doesn't do any of that. Has no planning, no representation space. No, no representation of path, nothing. Well, what was interesting was as I was building this, I was starting to become aware of the reactive robotics research of Robin Brooks and Luke Steeles and others, and they were doing exactly the same thing. Right, and that was the kind of official reaction to to the sort of crumbling of the AI paradigm. Hmm. It's sort of a trick, but it's not doing much. But your your senses give it a say to you that it's got a personality. Yeah. Um, um, and that even comes through on a video, even though it's not here. So <coughs> that's, that's, right. Know, is that right? You know, it was not intended to be a trick. But what I realised once I once I put it into public was that people attributed far more capability to it than it had, and often people would talk to it or gesture to it or do things that we had no notion were actually <laughs> happening. You know. Um, like this, you hear that this woman, he, she kind of tapped her foot on the ground to try and attack, attract its attention. But no, you're right. So, so one of the most interesting aspects of seeing this work in public is the way that, is what people attribute to it, how they, what their expectations are. Oh. A lot of the official response to like, is there ever any books or robots was that it's just a trick to, that it's, it's kind of you try to cheat system that's not you're not really making it being useful or intelligent. Right. Right. That's right. And that's you know uh, uh, I mean I, I you know I don't know how much about the, this intellectual history you guys know, but you're absolutely right. And one of those what that tells us is that is that the the sort of symbolic AI crowd um, had control of the discourse. Right? Um, at least at that time. And, and of course they had had control of the discourse for a long time because as I mentioned yesterday, um, you know, one of the sort of rhetorical battles in early AI was where implement an XOR gap, uh, which was which was you know really saying you know your technology can't do what our technology can do therefore your technology is bad. Of course the neural network technology could do all sorts of things that the that Boolean algebra couldn't do but 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 the but the playing field was already tilted that way, right? And and that's also true. There are some really interesting questions around that sort of reactive robotic philosophy of reactive robotics uh, one of the one of the conversations was about representation because of course most of the reactive other people of that persuasion were proposing that you did not need internal representation. And one of the arguments of post-cognitivist theorists 
to one degree or another is that they're opposed to the idea that representation is necessary, that internal representations are necessary. But then, but then you're drawn into this really complex question of what do we mean by representation? What is an internal representation? And as Rodney Brooks put it really well in one of his early papers, uh, he said, representation is one of those terms around which the artificial intelligence community has gathered. But if you look at what each researcher means by representation, there's no continuity across the community at all. They use, all use the same word, but they mean different things. So, so it, the, the notion of internal representation and representationalism in general is really fraught, and it's still fraught. You know, because in the post-cognitivist communities, there are there are the staunchly anti-representationalist camp, which they call externalists, and they're the staunchly representationalist camp. Right, everything that happens that's intelligent depends on an internal representation in the brain, and then there are people in the middle who are saying different sorts of things. Right, that there are certain certain sorts of things require representation and certain sorts of things don't, but we thought they did. And then there's another group of them. We really don't know what representation means anyway. And no one knows what's going on in the brain anyway. So, yeah, so it's kind of fascinating. Yes, sir. You know, I heard um, Stephen Pinker saying intelligence was like um, <coughs> someone's ability to you know, achieve a goal, like to overcome an obstacle. Um, I'm just wondering if, you know, with your robot there, is there like, there is no goal really. Right. Um, there's no, no. teleology behind right. it. Right. So, you know, it's this idea of like process versus outcome. Yeah. Um, and is that just a dualism that you, you know, you're having a battle with that the post cognitivists with? You know, well, you that? know, to go back to the reactive robotics thing, that was a criticism of reactive robotics that that reactive robots survived well in the world with a minimum of computation, were able to do things that the more conventional planning-based, goal-based robots couldn't do. Uh, but yet, getting goal-based behavior into them has turned out to be a problem. And then you get all these different sort of hybrid solutions. And, and but. The question of goals and problem solving are already kind of fundamental concepts of cognitivism. And some philosophers, in particular, I'm thinking of uh, Philip Agri, who I think is a really, really extraordinary commentator on this stuff, and really encourage you know, having a look at his work. He's got a book called Computation of Human Experience, I think. Um, you know, he says, well, and actually, it's, well, there's a number of different references here. Um, Paul Edwards' book, Closed World, is a really interesting history of the evolution of computing in the context of American Cold War politics. And he comes out with some kinds of statistics that are just mind-blowing in what they imply about the nature of computers as we have them today. He, he points out that, that you know, but, you know um, uh, uh, don't quote me on these numbers, uh, on these dates, but let's say between 1970 and 1985, 85% of all computing research in the United States was funded directly from, from, the, from DARPA and from US military sources and was pointed at Cold War agendas. And of course, the classic case of this is the SAGE system, the semi-automatic ground environment, which was, which was the, 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 a, a vast system, an early warning, automated early warning system, which integrated radars and other kinds of sensing devices from the Arctic all the way down to Central America into these massive computational coordination systems. And amongst other things that came out of that were time sharing, um, uh, multi-threading, uh, the, the keyboard screen pointer the interface, light pens and, and you know, and, uh, and all sorts of other fundamental aspects of what we today call computers. Um, so, so Edwards, you know, Edwards draws this parallel, right? And he says, well, most of computing development was pointed at military purposes for most of the kind of basic research period. 
Um, and then you get Phil Agri coming in 20 years later and saying, artificial intelligence and cognitivism determine intelligence in terms of problem solving. But for most of our daily lives, we're not problem solving. Most of our lives are routine. And when we are confronted with a problem, we tend to use routine sorts of ways to solve problems. So the whole notion of formulating intelligence around problem solving is a, is a kind of paranoid rationality, to use Les Levado's term, that the world is a dangerous place and if you're not on your feet, you know, detecting threats every second of the day, you're a goner. Well, life's just not like that, right? And that raises a really interesting question about, about what, what is it in these machines which inheres that kind of paranoid rationality? And how how is our how are our cultural processes now but I do think that there's something there. Right? You you, you really can't get around it. And one of the analogies that I've used uh, in the past is like Trying to use a computer for making art is like equipping a SWAT team with the very best hair dryers and toaster ovens money can buy <laughs> and sending them, you know, sending them into battle. Right? You just go, is this a real question? Is this a real problem? You know, I'd like to engage you guys in this because I think it's really an important kind of excavation of the smelly anaerobic mud, you know, that's underneath this, these kind of glossy titanium boxes and the, all of the kind of, you know, it'd be really interesting to find people going into, you know, what is it about the, the, the you know, internet protocols or, 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 or structure of HTML or which can be traced down to, you know, certain kinds of motivations, and, and even if those motivations can be found, does it mean that those qualities are in the technology we use now? Right? And if they are, what do we do about it? Have you, have you read um, uh, The Age of Intelligent Machines, Manuel Delander? Um, yes. Yeah. So he sort of links all that to historical bifurcations. <coughs> decisions there as well. So is there an argument that it's just historically contingent and we're just, you know, it's um, just evolutionary progress and there is like these forces in, in your discourse which are sort of um, competing against each other in a way? Well, you know, I have to say it's been a long time since I read Delander and I, and I, and I, uh, I, f I kind of felt like I probably didn't agree with his kind of fundamental assumptions then. Um, He, he has a kind of, um, a kind of, what, kind of geological, geo-evolutionary fatalism or something about, you know, which, which I'm not sure that I, I mean, he doesn't take social dynamics into account much, it seems, right? Am I, am I, would I be inaccurate in that? Um, we well, sort of uses assemblage theory just right. to say how um, you have very simple sort of feedback loops and then they they um, they keep emerging into different levels and levels and they build up uh, machine dynamics but also you know social social interactions. Right, it's the so it's, it's, it's the delusion machine. It's, 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 it's the delusion machine. Well, it's still lose like two point oh. Like right, he's, right. he's doing yeah. he's doing his own sort of take on it as well. Right. Mm. But, yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's really saying that, he, I think he's saying that intelligence is embodied at the very uh, fundamental level, like cellular automata, they sort of, they have their own sort of um, 
intelligence, but in that sort of... Yeah, but he's willing to say that the, the, the crystallization of clay, you know, has some sort of life about it. Yeah, like it's uh, imminent in the materiality. Right, yeah. right, right. So, yeah. mm. I felt a little uncomfortable going there. I'm more, I'm more very comfortable with the kind of my Poetic biological position, which you know, which grants all living matter or all living forms cognitive capability, whether it be a bacterium or a, or a you know neural network or, or or whatever. But I think the question of the question of intelligence outside of biology uh, is is a complex conversation. Um, Yeah, I wanted to go in a, in a different direction. Um, before there were digital computers, there were analog computers, mm. and they were outclassed by digital ones, it seems. Mm. Um, what What would your alternative to that thing be, to your laptop? <laughs> I mean, you know, if analog computers had been competitive, <coughs> computers would still have them. But they're much less accurate, much harder to set. Well, they did different things. Well, did they? Oh, I yeah. Mean, I mean, have they not been successfully simulated or replaced mm. by, you know, this is Turing's argument that you can't tell the difference between a simulation of a mechanical process and the actual process, provided that you're looking at it. Provided that you capture all the dynamics of the mechanical process that you, that you determine as salient. And, of course, in the point of analog computers, the, the mm. dynamical processes were set up to a particular end. So yeah. you know what they are, so yeah. you can simulate them. Yep. Um, They're also a big product of the military industrial processes, though, yeah. with uh, um, aligning guns and, uh, oh, and things. Yes. Things. Right, and actually, you know, if any of you are interested in that, David Mendel has a fantastic book on, on the sort of prehistory of cybernetics called Control Computing and, and, and Control and Computing mm -hmm. Before Cybernetics, or something of that sort. Wonderful, wonderful bit of research where he goes back and looks at mechanical analog computing. Um, I mean, that, that your question opens a whole range of different questions about the history of computing and what we mean by computing. Um, so, one of the things for me that, that is, distinguishes analog and digital is is that analog computing is well it's analogous it constructs an analogy and that analogy is dynamical yes. so so whereas of course digital computing does not create an analogy but it establishes symbols which are then algebraically manipulated. And it's true, I mean, I think this is also a very deep question in the philosophy of computing is, are all possible phenomena simulatable in the Boolean regime? So that, that is a well studied question. During completeness. No, Turing completeness is only symbolic manipulation. There may be non. Yeah, and so within any Turing machine, what can you compute? So there are lots of things that we know we can't compute. But already, the program will stop. I see, already in the symbolic realm, there are things we can't do. Yeah. But there may be other things that. Um, yeah, I think one of them, one of the, you know, yeah, so. so one of, one of the things that we tend to assume because we tend to believe in these boxes is that anything possible is possible. You know, to put it in very, very clumsy kind of terms.
If it finishes in 10 to 10 years, great. I mean, it's no use to me. We're yeah, actually dealing with much. Yeah, we're dealing with much smaller. <laughs> Mind you, what took Petty Mile 10 years takes this a minute and a half. So, yeah, yeah. That, uh, no, but I'm thinking you, you've made a more or less successful attack on digital, the digital black box approach. So I'm wondering what what else you would do. Um, well, I'm, there are two. I mean, I, I, I don't. You know, the thing is that that I want I want to kind of enunciate where I find the kind of limits, the, the, the edges of the capabilities you know, because by the sort of consumer culture of computing to, to assume that This is relevant, compatible. Well, so let's take a case study, right? Let's talk about social interaction on Facebook. Mm. <laughs> well, I was just going to say, mm. <laughs> you know, I mean, what we what we mm. see on a kind of social level is this kind of slippage, and you know, probably the same slippage happened with with you know, the publishing of books and God knows what else in the history of, of the human race. But our particular situation right now is to say, what was sociality like before Facebook? And how has this particular technology perturbed the nature of sociality in a way that we extend out into the world beyond our interactions with it? But how do churches change sociality? How does the telephone... The telephone I'm with you. I'm, I'm totally with you. All technologies do this. What, what I'm arguing for is not, it's not a bad thing, mm -hmm. but it's important for us to recognise that it's not a neutral thing and it didn't fall from heaven, you know, uh, to be all good things to all people, right? Does, but who, does anyone believe that? Yes, I think... Well, I don't know that anyone specifically mm -hmm. believes that, but I think that that's kind of... An, underlying implicit part of I mean, there's the whole generation of people who are turning against Facebook already, right? So younger people only go on Facebook so their grandparents can talk to their <laughs> grandparents, right? They're they've completely moved on from it already. So you know this whole idea of this benevolent control that's happening, I think is, is probably no, I don't think it. I, I'm not necessarily talking about control. I'm not talking about control in that sense necessarily. I mean sure it's media like just any medium Right. communication mm -hmm. right, right. Um, and look it's all targeted at social at, at, at capitalist culture and advertising right and you know that's the danger of artificial intelligence is that it's now focused not so much on these issues that it was preoccupied with earlier on right that it's actually focused much more on trying Making to second guess what you want to buy next yeah. mm -hmm. and um, that's where you know, having come back from a recent but like one of the leading AI conferences that's what a lot of stuff been currently being researched is how can you predict what you think someone's going to do next right. by based on their past. Right. And that's and that's and that's uh, yet again another one of these emerging phil uh, philosophical and, and, and theoretical challenges about the relationship between the kind of human culture we want and the kind of technology we're going to get. You know, and what can we do about it? Yeah, no, sorry. There was, there, you know, there was, I don't know whether you probably saw this, but recently there was a there was a kind of concerned scientist's letter trying to limit the applications yes, of AI in exactly warfare. Right? Big, but that was their big publicity. That was the drone. The, yeah, the drone. Right. Yeah, so, but the story behind that is really interesting. So at that conference, as I was involved with it, every day they had to do a press conference. And emails went around about what can we announce that's going to get media attention. Someone came up with the idea that oh, someone's proposing that we would cut AI out of weapons. That sounds like a really good thing. So after they did that, the next day I had a press conference because I had an artwork there. And uh, the, they were like, oh, we go in the New York Times. This is fantastic. You know, the letter's gone viral. But that, you know, they're high-fiving and we aced it. And then, and that was it, you know. Like, so they got their publicity that they needed for the conference because the conference brings in lots of money. And, but, you know, there are, there are no weapons that the, the sorts of technologies that they were talking about. 
And the you know the next day when it was turned for the artists to come and give their press release, it was an empty room. We were told that it was being uh, broadcast by YouTube, and that there were a few people. I think there was one journalist. So. <laughs> <laughs> motivations behind getting that kind of publicity are just human <laughs> motivations yeah look at me give me attention that everyone wants like everyone wants their discipline or their research or whatever to get more publicity because everyone's underfunded or underrecognized and well, they always want more anyway. the whole thing about ai research now i mean if you look at it and come back from this conference is that it's fragmented into hundreds of separate <laughs> modes of inquiry under this banner of intelligence and that it's such a big like it turns yeah, that it's kind of meaningless. And nobody in knowledge representation talks to anyone in data mining, for example, or do, but not very much. No one doing activity looks at researching. It's become um, this narrow area. If you want to succeed in AI, then you have to be very narrow and highly specialised, which is the way things always go. And eventually they get to generalist theory. There is no single kind of AI anymore. Right. Like there, were, there were like 10 parallel tracks, and nobody talked to anyone with parallel tracks. But that's, that's what kind of thrives at a kind of popular, that's why you get you know, Stephen Hawking saying, we better watch out because artificial intelligence is going to wipe out the human race. It's because yeah. it's from the from people outside that, it's so many different things that it creates this incredibly overinflated yeah. sense of it's what more like the bias of Keeps <laughs> telling you to buy this or whatever it was. You know, you watch dings you and says it's time to you know, tell you what to do. But it, yeah, there is there is no single artificial intelligence like there was in the day. It's when they were misguided. Brought back into the fight. People did realise that it was deep. And then that's an absurd conversation because, of course, all the factory workers who are making American commodities are in Taiwan and Korea. And he's yes, talking about American factories, so it's always about American. Right, 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 yeah, clearly. But then, yeah. it doesn't matter if China or the United States. Precisely. Just conscious of the time. Um, does anyone have any final questions or comments? Yes, sir. No, hi. Um, quite different. curious and a little sceptical that what is embodied in art is recognisable by anybody other than the artist. And I wonder whether you can elaborate on your views on that as a, as a composer. Um, so that's a number of different questions there. And, I, and, and I, I'm in my current, I, mean, I showed you art, an artwork that I've made, but my application of post-cognitive thought to the question of art practice is specifically to do with practices, mm -hmm. not to do with the, with the artifacts or, right. or phenomena which are generated. So in that sense, you know, I can answer your question, but it's not relevant to what I was talking yeah, about. Because I'm not, re I mean, I, I, I haven't concerned myself with the nature of the artwork or the way that the artwork communicates or whether it does or it doesn't. That's a, that's a whole other... It's a big 
art conversation, and of course there's a whole, you know, separate conversation about whether it should and whether you should care, and you know, yeah, there's an awful lot there. Right? But um, that's a, that's another that's a, that's another lecture. I think. I'm not sure that I'm the one who should give it because because I'm, you know, at this point. pretty much outside of the art world. I don't regard myself as a practicing artist. I don't want to, partly because I don't want to have to deal with those kinds of problems. I don't want to have to have the responsibility of communicating or not communicating with Joe Blow on the street and also John McCormack. Um, because that's one of the curious situations that artists have been put into, that there are almost no other members of Western culture who have that requirement, yeah. right? A practicing artist is meant to be intelligible by the five-year-olds who come to visit right. the exhibition at the gallery and also be unassailable in terms of, you know, the critique of Manuel de Landa or, yeah. or some other Derridian, you know, theorist <laughs> of art. I mean, you know, if you said to, you know, if you said to Niels Bohr, I'm sorry, your physics is not valid because my seven-year-old son doesn't <laughs> exactly. get it. Right. You know, it's like right. Well, that was melting it. It was. Yeah. 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 <coughs> so, the whole question of what an artwork should or shouldn't do, and the way that the artwork is constructed to function, you know, in our particular cultural context you know, I see as a cultural construction, as a very temporary cultural construction. It hasn't always been that way by any means. What we call artworks have not been considered to be artworks. The whole, the whole category of an artwork didn't exist in the way that we understand it, probably didn't exist a hundred years ago, let alone in the Renaissance. Even though we sort of propagate back this kind of, sort of impossible kind of blanket. I mean, people write, 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 art history books which go back to the Paleolithic. It's completely absurd. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like just... It's, it's, you know. It could be very comprehensive. But you know what I mean? I, mean, like, to, I remember, I had a, it's a funny story, I had a student um, at one point who was very smart, obviously, and he was, he was pulling my leg, but, when, but he said that, you know, when, you know, Bongo the caveman painted his bison on the wall of the cave, he'd have a little art opening and serve <laughs> cheese and, and white wine, you know? And it was like, that's fantastic! Fascinating, you've raised so many really interesting questions. I hope everyone's really enjoyed it. Please join me in thanking Simon. Yeah. Thank you.